Well, I'd like to welcome you to the online service of Sindal Baptist Church today. My name is Mandy and I'm one of the pastors here at Sindal and it's really a privilege to have you join with us as we participate in this expression of church today. I don't know how you're feeling at the moment, maybe a bit more hopeful as you see some light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel of isolation or, or maybe just a little bit over all of it and longing for more of normal in all of its various forms. I know that for many of us, these weeks of isolation, as well as the lifting of some restrictions in the last week and a half, it's creating a hunger to be together and to see one another face to face again and to worship together in the one location as the family of God that we are. And that's a good thing, isn't it? To, to miss that and to long for it. It's a sign of God's grace at work in us. But you know, wherever you are today and whoever you're with, I pray that as you participate in this service, that you'll experience God's grace, knowing he is with you, knowing that he is with us, apart from each other physically, but together in Christ. Today, we've got our senior pastor, Chris Danes, preaching the fourth and final message in our series. I know this much is true. And so we look forward to that a little later in the service. But for now, we're going to spend some time praising our amazing God and lifting up our hearts to him. So let's worship Jesus together in song. Well, hello, welcome to Sindel Baptist House Church. We are wrapped that you are here with us, joining us today as we worship our great God. Wherever you are, why don't you stand or sit, but sing out about the goodness of our God. Sing, let the king. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are
Yes, God, you are good. God, we declare that today, that you are good and that our heart belongs to you. May that be our prayer and may that be a deep truth that we resonate with today. And God, because you're so good, we just trust you and may our lives be totally focused and built around you. Sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, 
God, we just turn our eyes to you today. Lord, may we be more aware of your glory and of your grace towards us. We just turn your, our eyes towards you today and we, are, we open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. In your mighty name, amen. Well, thanks so much to the team for leading us in worship. It's, it's such a powerful expression of our faith and our trust in Jesus, isn't it? As we declare in song and, and with our whole hearts, all that he means to us. We're so thankful to the many members of the Sindel Baptist community who are continuing to give generously to the offering every week. It's an act of worship as well as an act of trust in God, isn't it? For, for many of us, to give is an act of sacrifice that feels particularly tough at the moment. But God knows this and he will honour you for the way you are practically demonstrating your trust in him in this season. And we trust that you're experiencing his presence as well as his provision as you step out in faith in this way. For those who would like to start participating in the offering, you can find information on how to do so at www.sb.org.au forward slash give. During the month of May as a church, Sindel Baptist raises funds to support global interaction in some of the great work that they do in sharing the good news of Jesus around the world. This year, all funds raised will go to toward four different projects and teams. One of these projects centres around our continued support of the Hutchinson family who live on mission in Cambodia. Uh, Luke and Rachel, along with their three children, Isaac, Talia and Michaela, they serve among Global Interactions team in Cambodia as the project's team leaders. Knowing personally the peace and the joy that comes from a living relationship with Jesus, Luke and Rachel, they are passionate about sharing this same Jesus with their Khmer friends. They're currently investing many hours per week in culture and language lessons with a local language nurturer so they can communicate effectively with their Khmer friends. And they long to see the Khmer people be transformed by encountering Jesus in a way that they can understand. And lives are being changed through the relationships the team is forming through the opportunities from this project. Our May missions appeal here at Sindel, it's coming to a close. So if you're thinking about giving or would like to learn more about May Missions Month here, then simply head to sb.org.au forward slash May Missions for all the details. Well, we're going to spend some time praying together. So would you join with me in prayer? Lord God, we just want to begin now by pausing and to be silent and still before you 
to gaze upon you and stand in awe of you and to remind ourselves that you are God, that you are holy and to honour you above all. And we want to remember that you are our father, our, our heavenly parent, and you are here with us and that we are your children, holy and deeply loved by you. And because of that, all is well. And Father God, as we do so, we're reminded of all the reasons that there are to rejoice in you, in who you are, in what you've done, in all you've accomplished in us and for us. We want to remind our souls because there's this tendency for us to be so dull and so forgetful at times, God. And so we just rejoice now in your goodness and your faithfulness to us this past week, in your grace and your forgiveness toward us, in your wisdom and your guidance provided to us, your power and your strength at work in us. So we rejoice in these things now. And God, we're just so thankful that we can come to you and that we can approach you with grace, your, your throne of grace, with confidence, that we can ask you for things and that you say that you'll give us your mercy and that we'll find your grace to help us in our time of need. And so God, we just come to you now and we ask you for what we need. Some of us need to ask you for forgiveness. And so we do that now. We confess that our hearts have gone astray and we turn them back towards you and your love for us. Thank you for cleansing and renewing us. Some of us need to ask you for provision or for guidance, for strength or for grace, for hope or for comfort, for the ability to trust and to go on. And so we do that right now. And God, we ask and we entreat you on behalf of our world. And we, we pray for the sick and for the grieving that you would heal and that you would restore and that you would comfort. We pray for healthcare workers, that you would protect and you would strengthen them. We pray for the vulnerable, that they would be able to rely on others around them for the support that they need. We pray for the unemployed, that you would provide for them through their families and through their communities. We pray for our leaders, that they would have wisdom to do what is best for all. We pray for students and we pray for families, that we'd, you would give them patience and discipline. And God, we pray for churches and we pray for ourselves as followers of Jesus that we would know best how to show and to share the love of Jesus at this time, as well as what it will mean for us to be the church in the coming days. And finally, God, we take this opportunity to yield ourselves to you afresh, to surrender our lives to you and to your will, and to align ourselves with your purposes and your kingdom. Take our lives, God, and use them for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have the opportunity now to hear a message from our senior pastor, Chris. So let's listen together with our hearts for what Jesus is wanting to speak to us about during this time. I'm going to hand over to Chris now. Thanks, Chris. Life is pretty unpredictable. Last week was quite the week. On the Sunday, my body had decided it had enough and began to give me some serious feedback about the kidney stone lodged in my system. I ended up in emergency and then on Monday in surgery and then didn't get out of hospital until the Tuesday. 
Life's unpredictable. We've been saying that for some months now. COVID-19 seems to have given us a whole new meaning to the word unpredictable. But as the restrictions come off and the traffic begins to flow again and life begins to return to something resembling normal, can it be easily lulled into thinking that our old means of security and stability are back on track. We're custom built to forget moments of difficulty and move on with our lives, but in doing so, we can miss the opportunities that have been presented in the COVID-19 crisis. When our normal sources of security and stability have taken a hammering, it's been good to take a look at the source of security and stability that is above and beyond normal circumstances. In our series, I Know This Much Is True, we've spent some time taking a fresh look at the life and teaching of Jesus Christ and how how that can help us find our bearings when all other things are stripped away. When the unpredictable happens, Jesus can be our go-to. Last week, you might remember that we ended with that ancient little prayer Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I actually prayed that prayer repeatedly last week when I was in more trouble than the early settlers with my wretched little kidney stone. I prayed it on the way into emergency when the pain got out of control. I prayed it on the way into surgery when I knew what was coming on the other side. And I prayed it on the other side when the post-op pain was out of control again. The fascinating and astounding thing is that even though each of those spaces was horrendously uncomfortable, that little prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, brought enormous comfort. It contextualised my pain. There was a deep sense of his presence with me there as I prayed it. As I said before, I didn't see this week coming at all. I had it all uh, booked in, all the surgery booked in for weeks down the track. But that's the beauty of walking with Jesus. He did see it coming. And I don't know how it works, but I found again and again during this experience, and even during this experience of COVID-19, that without any explanation or ability to scientifically verify it, somehow Jesus' peace became mine. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Whether your pain is post-op recovery, or whether it's an emotional uh, type of pain, or whether your pain is relational or vocational or financial, the same Jesus can bring you peace in your situation. We've talked about it now for three weeks when everything we normally rely on becomes unstable. In Jesus' teaching, we can find solid ground to build our lives on. When we're helpless and we feel like a total passenger to forces beyond our control, in Jesus' authority, we can find power beyond our own to move forward. When we failed by our own standards and feel like we can't meet the grade, Jesus, in Jesus' mercy, we can find forgiveness, strength and renewal for the road ahead. Through his teaching, his power, his mercy, Jesus can change the world, us and the world around us. We've talked about what Jesus brings to the table now for three weeks. Uh, This week, I thought it might be good to talk about our part in all of this. The two questions that come to mind as we consider this is, what is our part? And secondly, but equally importantly, how can we play it? In Jesus, God's taken the initiative. But like all healthy relationships, it's a two-way street. We have a part to play. So how can we play that part well? In today's passage, we find Jesus in his final address to the disciples before he's betrayed and crucified. Understandably, Jesus spends quite a bit of his time preparing them for life on the other side of the crucifixion and resurrection. In John 14, Jesus says, Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live you will also live. On that day, you'll realise that I'm in the Father, you are in me and I am in you. So when Jesus is no longer here bodily, those who follow him will still have the capacity to be in him. What does he mean by that? What does Jesus mean by that? And how can we work to let that shape our lives in the here and now? What's our part and how can we play it? 
Before we open John 14 together, let's pray. God, I ask that as we look at this uh, together on, on the screen, I ask God that you would speak to each one of us right where we are, in our homes, on our phones, on our computers, wherever we are, I ask that you'd speak to us in that space and show us what our part might be in living a life on solid ground with Jesus. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Christmas, if I had said to any of you what, that the entire world would be brought to its knees by an invisible enemy, you probably would have laughed me out of the room. If I told you that uh, it would be an enemy that cannot be seen or smelled and that even if you touch it, you won't initially feel it, an enemy that has no sound nor taste, but an enemy that has the capacity to kill you over a relatively short period of time, and if I said that this unseen enemy would see us locked in our homes, out of work, out of sporting fields, out of friendship groups, if I'd said that this invisible enemy would stop international travel and trade in its tracks and it would simultaneously take a wrecking ball to the whole world economy, that would be, it'd bring great economic powers like US, France, uh, Italy, UK, Germany and China to their knees, if I said that, that you'd be unable to attend worship or sporting events for months on end, most of you, if I said those things, would have thought that I was being hysterical at best or possibly having some kind of serious meltdown at worst. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The US are discovering this the hard way regardless of whether they think COVID-19 is a hoax or not, the fact is that over 88,000 people in that country have lost their lives to it. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Because we're so heavily reliant on our senses to help us work out what's real and what's not, often we make the terrible mistake of thinking that what we see is actually all there is. Ultimately, if we're to be honest, the reason we've believed that COVID-19 is a real threat is because of the amount of people that it's killed worldwide. We cannot see the disease, but eventually we can see the effects of the disease. Even 2,000 years ago, Jesus knew that this was a default setting for humanity. So he reminds his disciples that whilst they might not have his body with them for the rest of time, they would have his presence with them for the rest of time. Before the before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you'll see me because I live, you will also live. On that day, you'll realise that I'm in the Father and you're in me and I'm in you. Just because you can't see him, it doesn't mean Jesus is not there. Jesus lives and because he lives, the same life is available to all those who follow him. I'm in my Father, you are in me and I am in you. You might not see Jesus bodily, but his life can be found in those who follow him. One of the most vivid recollections I have of seeing the life of Jesus in another was when I visited a man called Don Cameron at a ramshackle building in Dandenong. Don ran an outreach centre for people living rough and every Wednesday they'd feed 150 homeless folks lunch and eat with them. Don was a salt of the earth type and utterly shameless about his faith. Every lunchtime, Don would have someone share about the love of Jesus with the people who came to eat. When I visited him, in the, it's the closest encounter that I've ever had with the mercy of Jesus. Don reminded me to park in a secure car park nearby as he had his own car stolen several times by the people he ministered to. He laughingly said, they just needed it more than I did at the time. I sat with Don with 150 homeless people buzzing around and lining up for dinner. And he said, Chris, these guys might look a bit rough, but they are so beautiful on the inside. Feet of clay, but hearts of gold. Every single one of my Middle Eastern suburbs sensibilities was rattled as I joined Don and his friends at the meal table that lunchtime. We shared together over a three-course meal prepared by volunteers and served by volunteers and also some of the homeless folks. And again and again, we were interrupted by folks 
asking for a swag, uh, a place for them to sleep, asking for money, asking for prayer, telling Don their story, and most of all, thanking Don again and again and again. They'd look at me and say, this bloke is a legend. It was clear that Don was their guy. Some of the stories to explain why they needed a swag or money to me sounded pretty suspect. But watching Don, you'd never know it. Always a wry smile and he'd pull out his forms and start going through it with them. It was absolute bedlam, but the warmth was real. Like the tax collector's party we talked about the other week, the language was probably a little less religious than the local church. The company was probably somewhat less polite. But even in my middle-class discomfort, it was utterly undeniable. Jesus was there. His teachings spoken over lunch, his power offered in prayers, his love and his mercy overflowing in abundance through Don and his team. When Jesus said, on that day you'll realise that I am in my Father, you are in me and I am in you, I'm pretty sure that's the kind of thing he meant. Jesus' life was undeniably present in Don. Don's no longer with us. Cancer took him far too early, but I'll never forget meeting Jesus in him that day. I don't know about what kind of story you want told about you when you're gone. But I wouldn't imagine many of us could top Don's. Pretty plain spoken man doing extraordinary things for marginalised people. And because, all because of his love for Jesus. Jesus in the Father, Don in Jesus and Jesus in Don made a massive difference for homeless people in Dandenong. Most of us want to make a difference in the world. Unfortunately, many of us get sidetracked, distracted. And along the way, uh, we get caught up in other things. I can say from my own experience, it's one thing to begin with Jesus. It's a whole other thing to stay in Jesus. It's a super easy to sign up, but Jesus himself predicted that not everyone that signs up would last the distance. In the parable of the sower recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus talks of four kinds of people who hear his word. Only one of them makes it. And for all of them, the survival of their faith is contingent on one thing and one thing alone. But the seed that fell on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain or accept the word, and by persevering, produce a crop. Hearing, retaining or accepting, and persevering. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is consistent on his teaching being not just knowledge-based, but action-based. Jesus' words are no use to anyone if we don't put them into practice. Interestingly, when Jesus elaborates on what it looks like to remain in him, there's a clear call back to his words. In John 14, 21, Jesus elaborates. He says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. There are two things of importance here for the person who wants to remain in Jesus. Firstly, to know and secondly, to obey his commands. I reckon the rub for lots of people is that we don't like being told, do we? And so many times with Jesus, we treat his commands like they're kind of optional. Love each other as I have loved you, commanded Jesus. Most of us put this one through our personal preference filter and we might tolerate people, but if we're to be intellectually honest, love is probably not the correct descriptor, descriptor for our behaviour and actions toward at least some people in our lives. So we water it down to love people you like as I have loved you. And when we do that, When we water down Jesus' commands, we water down our relationship with it. Forgive those who sin against you from the heart. We put that through the personal preference filter. We water it down and it becomes forgive people from the heart as long as they haven't gone too far. As long as their sin against you isn't too big. And when we do that, we water down Jesus' commands. We water down our relationship with it. 
How about this one? I tell you, anyone who looks on a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, I've got to say that for many years I tried to lower the bar on this one. I, I can't help it. It's part of being a man. It's testosterone. I'm wide through the eyes. If it's, it's not wrong if you don't act on it. It's not hurting anyone. All sorts of personal preference filters that we put over Jesus' teachings. And when we do that, we water down Jesus' commands. We water down our relationship with it. In the end, I sense the invitation uh, to take Jesus' word for it on that one and with his help, ruthlessly eliminate lust from my life. What I've found in this quest is that our obedience to Jesus in this area of life has opened up conversation for a whole swag of other areas. For instance, what I watch on TV, what I talk about, what I listen to on Spotify. The interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't just seem to want me to mindlessly obey his teachings. He often wants to be in conversation about why. It fascinates me that a couple of verses down, Jesus doubles down on the concept of obedience uh, enabling relationships. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them and will come to them and will make our home with them. The imagery is powerful. We will come to them and make our home with them. It's one thing to share life at work or at play. It's a whole other, whole other level of intimacy to gather together under the same roof, to make a home together. My Father will love them and will come to them and will make our home with them. Obedience to Jesus isn't just a call to doing or not doing. Obedience to Jesus is a call toward relationship. Jesus doesn't just want his followers to strictly follow a set of carefully articulated rules and regulations. Jesus wants his followers to, well, follow. It's about relationship, not rules. The interesting thing about the ongoing obedience conversation with Jesus in my own life is that I can't think of one area where my obedience to Jesus has not actually improved me as a human being. Obeying and conversing with Jesus has made me more loving, more forgiving, more courageous, more generous, more self-disciplined, more self-aware, more resilient, less judgmental, less brutal, more sensitive. Having said that, I must admit that I'm still undergoing sensitivity training with Jesus and the help of his sidekick, Joanne. Uh, I've got a long way to go in many of these areas, particularly sensitivity, and Jesus and I we're still on the journey. Only one question, are you? Are you on the journey with Jesus? We can talk about Jesus all day long. We can go to church. We can read the Bible and know his words. But Jesus is extraordinarily plain spoken about what is required to be on the journey with him. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. That's what it looks like to be on the journey with Jesus. Very next verse is equally clear. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So not obeying equals not on the journey with Jesus. Pretty confronting, isn't it? But I guess it's clear. The beauty and the curse of all of this is it's pretty easy to change your trajectory. Pretty easy to go backward, pretty easy to go forward. If you know Jesus' teaching and you're doing everything but obeying it, you can change trajectory. Just start the conversation and start obeying. Start listening and responding to him. If you're obeying Jesus' teachings and in regular conversation with him, then stay the course and he'll teach you on the road. Thankfully, Jesus also gives his disciples a tip-off as to how he's going to do this how he converses with us whilst not bodily being here and how we can converse with him. He says in the very next verse, I've spoken to the, this while I'm still with you, but the advocate or the Holy Spirit who the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. 
this advocate or literally companion called the Holy Spirit, who the Father sends, will remind us and call out to us, will empower us. It's a pretty good deal. Obedience enables conversation through the Holy Spirit. This idea sounds a lot more complex than it is. The Holy Spirit is a way of understanding the life of Jesus within you. It's that gentle voice calling you forward. You know when you want to do or say something that's not right and that gentle voice within you calls you to something different. Yeah, I, I know people who swore like troopers until they followed Jesus. The Holy Spirit or God's presence within them called them to something different. I know that in my life it's been the Holy Spirit or God's presence within me that calls me away from all sorts of unhelpful stuff towards Jesus, from lust to love, from greed to generosity, from judgment to mercy. The Holy Spirit or God's presence within not only helps us to hear and understand and obey the teachings of Jesus, the Holy Spirit or God's presence within us gives us the power to do it. So more, the more we attune ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the more potent our lives can become. The more we listen for that still small voice within us. Unfortunately, we often confuse our own voice for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And often we insist on doing things our way. And when we do, we lose power. Some years ago, I bought a new motor mower and when I bought the mower, I wanted the biggest, baddest engine on my mower possible so that I could cut through everything but the kitchen sink. Dog bones, long wet grass, anything that got in this bad boy's way would be cut down to size. It was a ripper of a lawnmower. It's been a fabulous mower to have, but this year it began to be a bit harder to start. It took a few more goes and it seemed to be not quite so strong in the wet grass. Anyway, I did what any home handyman would do. I put some good earmuffs on and I cranked it up flat out. Solved, right? Wrong. Halfway through the lawns, uh, my mower stopped dead. I'd used a full tank of fuel for half of my lawns. So I fixed it. I've topped up the fuel. And then after a good 15 minutes of pulling the ripcord, it started. And so after another five minutes, I hit another particularly thick batch of grass and the mower stopped dead. And I mean absolutely stopped dead this time. It wouldn't start again. So putting on my best can-do attitude, I looked, I took the spark plug out and I stared at, at it for a while because I'd seen mechanics do that. And then I cleaned it. I'd seen mechanics do that too. And I put it back in. Then spent another 20 minutes pulling on the ripcord. Nothing. After some time, I finally loaded the mower into the car and took it to the mower guy up the road for its annual service. I honestly thought I was up for a new mower. If I couldn't fix it, surely no one else could. A few days later, I picked it up and I started first go without any effort. Apparently, my annual service had happened three years ago and the mower guy said to me that it just needed some tender, loving care and a few new blades and filters and it was as good as new. What it actually needed was the eye of an expert to know what needed changing and what didn't. Not some backyard home handyman with some good ideas and a can-do attitude. The idea of an expert can make a huge difference to mending broken things. I don't know why I wasted so much time on tinkering, trying to sort it out myself, but there's something deep within most of us that likes to fix ourselves. And you know what I mean, it's not just mowers, right? We have this nagging feeling within that things aren't right, so we tinker. We tell ourselves that if we do more or we love more or whatever, we'll be happier. If we exercised more, if we ate right, we would be fitter and happier. So we sign up for a gym membership or start the latest new taste-free diet and hope that it will change our lives. But deep within, we know it. We know we're just tinkering. When COVID-19 came over the horizon, there were lots of people who thought that more time at home with their family would enhance their relationships. And in some cases, that's true. But for many, it simply created different kinds of dysfunctions. We thought that more time might change our lives and set us in the right direction. 
But deep within, you know it, we're just tinkering. So before we get back into our old rut, before life goes back to something resembling normal, before we're back at work and commuting freely, here's a thought. Why not get an expert to take a look under the bonnet to help you make some real change? Why not give Jesus a shot at the title? He's already given us the mechanism for being on the journey with him, obedience. So one final question to help us stop tinkering and get back on track. What does obedience to Jesus look like for me right now? Ask yourself that. What's the invitation that he's whispering to you? And how can you move into responding to it? That old song comes to mind, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. So simple and so true. Maybe it's time to stop tinkering at the edges and respond to the call of Jesus. The call of Jesus is simple but effective, trust and obey. The sad thing is you probably already have an idea what he's calling you to do and you've just been avoiding it, putting it off like an elephant in the room, right? It might be a long-standing grudge against someone that is calling you to forgive and release, but you've been putting it off, tinkering with everything else and hoping that will fix things. The call from Jesus is simple but effective trust and obey. It may be that lust or greed is running rampant in your life and calling you, and Jesus is calling you to humble generosity, to give without credit or kudos, to help the poor and care for the needy. But you've been putting it off, tinkering with finance, trying to make gains, reduce losses, and hoping that that will fix things. The call from Jesus is simple but effective, trust and obey. It may be relational dysfunctional that's creating havoc in your life. He's calling you to own your dysfunction and take responsibility for the hurt and the damage you have and are causing. But you've been avoiding the pain of confession. You've been avoiding the pain of admitting it tinkering with self-help programs and books, trying to repair yourself without having to change and hoping that that will fix things. The call from Jesus is simple but effective, trust and obey. So whatever the case may be, we can, make, can we make a course correction right now? All we need to do is own it and ask for Jesus to help us move on it. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Loving God, we come before you now, warts and all, and we confess our part in our dysfunction. We know that you want the best for us, but many times we choose something else and we own our dysfunction right now. Just own whatever you need to in your heart before Jesus. Name the dysfunction specifically, the thing you've been avoiding, and apologise to him for that. And Lord, we ask that you might show us the path forward and give us the strength to walk in it with you. Why don't you ask for the strength to do what he's calling you to do, to, be, to move into obedience with Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us to a life with you. And that you called that life, life to the full. Lord, we ask that you would work with us to make every moment count. And we ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been so good to have you here with us for this series. And before I hand back to Mandy, let me leave you with a little promise from Jesus found at the end of our passage today. Jesus said to those who follow him, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and don't be afraid. This week, as you seek to trust and obey, may the peace of Christ rest over you and the presence of the Holy Spirit rest in you. 
Well, it's been good to have you with us for our service today. We really hope that you've been encouraged by your online experience with us and we'd love to have you join with us again next week. For more information, for content, for opportunities to connect, then you can subscribe to our Sindal Baptist e-news by sending an email to newsletter at sb.org.au. And in this way, we can communicate with you more effectively as well as keep you up to date with all of the important things that are going on in the life of this church. Well, we hope you have a fabulous week and we look forward to catching you next time at Sindal Baptist House Church. God bless.